Welcome to Chapter 3.2 of Screen Design in Adkio. As you know, we are coming from Chapter 3.1, where we explained all the basic components for designing screens, and now we will embark on Chapter 2, where we will explore advanced components. Let's begin. We start with the button creator in this second tab. These buttons allow us to configure a variety of settings. Unlike the previous buttons, these have the option to upload our images, and we can add as many images as we want. Typically, each button will have two images, one for the deactivated state and one for the activated state. We will not cover how to add images here, because the next chapter will be entirely dedicated to designing buttons and integrating them here. Just know that you would add those images here, one for deactivated and one for activated. Additionally, each of these specialized images must be given a different name. The initial part is the same as always, the coordinates where the button will be placed, which can obviously be adjusted manually for precision, and of course, the size. Since it is a square element, we only have the size, not width and height. The button types are the same as before, but as we just saw, we can add our own. Now comes a very important option. Let's enlarge it so you can see it better. The switch option allows this object to behave like a standard switch with on and off states. The custom buttons option is very powerful, allowing us to decide what happens when the user presses the button, releases the button, or holds the button for a long time. We can differentiate and send different messages based on how the user interacts with the button. I have never used these functions because I haven't needed to. As you can see, it always connects to an Adkio Lite server and a memory address that could be the same as always, with Unit 1 as usual. The System button option is super powerful, and we will see why. When we select a system button, we have a series of available actions. These buttons allow us to switch from one panel to another if our interface has multiple panels. This way, we can select the next panel, the previous panel, the last panel, the first panel, or a specific panel. If we want to jump to a particular panel, we select this option and indicate which panel we want to jump to. This allows us to create navigation buttons, the system already has appropriate buttons for moving to the next or previous panel if desired. If we stay on the Select Panel option, we can create a button to exit. We could create one that tells it to disconnect from Adkio, connect Adkio, go to a web page link, and open a browser within our screen. This can be very powerful if we want to integrate something from our web into the screens. We can run another Android application from here, selecting which application to run. This would be useful, for example, to integrate a music management app. We can show the list of available panels for the user to select which one they want to jump to and show a pop-up window. The most used buttons are, for example, the Select panel. Let's try it and see how this Select panel works. Let's see where these panel numbers are to identify which one we want to jump to. Let's set a smaller size. If we want to see the panel list, we have the Select Panel option. By default, we have two panels, Home and One. This ID we see here is what the button refers to when we say we want to jump to a specific panel. Let's make our button jump to ID 2. We go back to our button and tell it here that we want it to jump to panel 2. We execute it, and as you see, we have gone to panel 2. Panel 2 has a default arrow that allows us to return to panel 1 and move to panel 2. This would be the most traditional. Let's see how this is done so you can see it's very easy. The default panels in Virtuino 6 have a button to go to the next panel, and if we go to the next panel,
there is a button to go to the previous panel. It's very easy. Let's go back to our work panel and continue reviewing customizable button features. As you can see, when we select the button type, the window changes completely as it has different properties. The button with a regulator is a button that, when pressed, shows a slider. I have never used it. I've never needed it. If you want to use it, know that it is a mix between a button and a slider, but it is a hidden slider that appears when pressed. Let's stay with Switch, and as you can see, it has values for on and off. The same as before. When this switch is shown as on, it displays differently from the off mode, and vice versa. Additionally, the button is disabled if the variable values do not correspond to either on or off. The most common option is the first one. We have now seen customizable buttons. Keep in mind that we still have the most powerful part. Designing our buttons and loading them here. Great. Let's move on to the next object. Let's save it. And the control coming up is one of the most important. Although this appears to be an advanced value display, besides visualizing, it also allows us to edit variable values. This is a crucial part of any user interface. Imagine we are displaying the ambient temperature, but next to it, we have a field for our desired temperature. If we need to write the variable value to set a desired temperature of 20 degrees, this object will let us do that. Let's explore it in depth. Of course, we start by connecting it to our variable. We see it has the usual properties, size, position, many customization options for displaying the variable, text color, alignment, vertical and horizontal size, font type we already know, and font style we also know. If we want to add a border to the variable, this border option is interesting. Because if it is a field we can edit and write in, it is useful that all texts shown without a border are non-editable, and those with a border inviting writing within the frame are editable. Let's say the background is black. The text is white, and the border color will be blue. We can round the corners of the rectangle that frames our value. It usually looks nice. Let's set a 4-pixel radius for those quarter circles that will form part of our rectangle corners, and a 1-pixel border thickness, for example. Next, we specify the type of value we will use. In our case, imagine this, 255 we are working with is a temperature. Let's say it is simply a number. We specify the maximum and minimum values. Imagine we are working with temperature. We can set the minimum value to 18 degrees and the maximum to 25 degrees. The maximum and minimum values for this control. As always, the conversion allows us to work with this variable differently than it comes in the protocol. Remember that in a previous object, we put 0.01 .01 to divide by 100. As always, the symbol. If we are working in degrees Celsius, we can add the degree symbol and a C. And how many decimals we want to display. This is all well for visualizing the variable, but the important part comes now. In the More tab, we have an option that allows us to show an editor when clicking on this text. When this editor opens, we have the option to show a dialog to edit the value. We can do nothing display a window with the maximum and minimum, and allow selection between those values. Or show an editor to simply edit the value. If it were a date or time, have a specialized editor for that. In our case, we will never work with complete dates because our protocol does not allow sending them. We always work with day, month, and year separately. So let's show a dialog to edit the value. We won't do anything for a long press, and it is not a password. In the case of a slider, what steps should it have? If it goes one by one, ten by ten, etc. The upper and lower limits, as we said, are 25 and 18 degrees, respectively. 
I don't think there are any decimals. And if we want to give it a title, for example, select desired temperature. Let's test how it works. Let's see it here and see what happens when we run it. We see no value appears in the field, right? And why could this be? It's straightforward. We know the variable has 200 feet 5, as seen in other indicators. And we set upper and lower limits of 18 and 25 degrees for this field. Therefore, since it is outside the limits, it shows no information. However, if we lower the value to 1 compatible with the acceptable ranges, we see it does show it. The other important part is that this edit field, when clicked, takes us to an editor where we can both increase and decrease the value and write if desired. We erase and write 25 degrees. We confirm, and as we see, all others update to the value we wrote in this field. So, to edit values on our controller, like writing the desired temperature, we have this type of control where we can decide how to edit it with its maximums, minimums, or as seen in this case, with arrows to increase and decrease values up to the maximum and minimum. Very well, let's return to editing. And there is nothing more important to see in this type of field. The next two objects we won't review because the text value display is the same as the advanced value display, but with fewer options. Therefore, you will find a very similar element, and it can also be edited. And similarly, the analog instrument creator is just like the element we've seen here. The difference is that this one is already customized and allows us to choose very few parameters. On the other hand, this one lets us choose absolutely everything. The ranges, the color of the numbers, the color of the ranges, the background color, the color of the needle, etc. Since it is an element that we won't use very often, as it isn't widely used in the lighting or climate control sectors, we won't go into it in depth. Just know that it allows for full configuration of colors, the needle, backgrounds, scale colors, and so on. Okay, right. Let's move on to the next element, a rotary switch. If we look at this element, we see that it is of this type, and if we run it, we see that we can rotate it. Okay, and in this case, it seems to have only two options, off and on. But we will be able to choose how many steps this rotary switch has. Okay, so let's look at its properties. We have the option to manage a single variable or send controls to different variables. This can be very useful, as this is one of the few objects within the screen designer that allows us to interact with different variables in the controller. Let's look at both options. If we choose the option to control a single variable, we can select a variable, our variable number 1. Very well. We can choose its position, its width, its refresh rate, the button parameters, the button type, and which one we like the most. I like this one more, for example, and the background of this button could be, for example, for temperature, this one. In the case that we have, imagine a fan speed with three options, for example. Let's look at the next tab, and this is the position editor. As you can see, it has two positions as we saw before, but we can add as many as we want. Position 3 will send the value 3. Let's review the two that were created by default. Position 2 sends the value 2, and position 1 sends the value 1. This would be very typical, as I mentioned before, in climate control where we can choose whether we want the fan to be off, at low speed, medium speed, or high speed. For this, we would need one more value, which is 4, and we would then have our positions for off, low speed, medium, and high speed. Let's see how it behaves. So, in this case, it should have four positions. One, two, as you see, three, and four. 
let's look at the option of sending values to different variables to see the significant difference we have. In this case, we see the module and variable configuration it is associated with here, and we have it in each of the options. We select a value and could specify that when it is in position 1, it sends a value to a specific variable in our controller, and so on with all the others. OK. So, it is a good example of a single control that sends values to different variables if we wish. Let's move on to the next element that might interest us. Vertical selector. This type of button is a set of buttons that forms a single element. However, it has several buttons, and each of these buttons will allow us to send a value. The special feature they have is that, when you press any of them, all the others in the set automatically deactivate. Let's see how it works. Like the previous case, it can control a single memory variable, or it can control different variables. The most common use is to control a single variable, for example for typical climate control states like auto, on, off. For example, in the case, as before, where we select a single variable, it asks us which variable it is. Perfect. We will leave the refresh at zero to take the default which we had configured globally, which was one second. Let's see that in buttons, in this case, we have only two buttons. Let's do the example I just mentioned. Button 1 will send a 1, which would be our on. Let's select another type of image. Let's select, for example, these buttons. OK. Confirm. The two would be the same, and we will create a 3 for our on, off, auto. As you can see, it is a block of three buttons. If we run it, this one would send a 1, this one would send a 2, and this one would send a 3. They are mutually exclusive. They can be very useful for certain cases. Let's return to editing. As you can see, I have changed its size, made it a bit smaller, and we'll take this opportunity to look at a few new things we haven't covered yet. Firstly, we know these buttons are on, off, auto, because I told you, but there is no text on the button itself, and the buttons don't have the option to add text. So, what are we going to do? We're going to use the static text we saw earlier to place it on each of the buttons. Instead of creating a new object by clicking the plus button, we will copy this object and paste it over the buttons because we haven't learned how to copy and paste yet. So, we'll use this case to learn how to copy and paste. We select the label, in this case the text we want to copy, without making any changes, just selecting it so it turns red. We then click Copy. Now, if we go here, we have the option to paste it. We need three buttons, so we'll paste three times. So, paste, paste, and paste. They all end up on top of each other. Let's place them here. One, two, roughly like that. Now we simply click on them and change the text. Let's zoom in a bit. And if we now go to Run, we see that we have our buttons with their correct values. OK, let's also take this opportunity to look at something else. You see that we have the On label selected here, and it's on top of the button, right? Well, we also have the option to send it to the back, making it disappear. Why does it disappear? Because it is underneath the button. This is important in many cases where you want to, for example, do what we discussed in the previous chapter about placing an image over a control to hide it. It's important that the image is above the button. In this case, let's select On again and move it to the front. Now it's back in front, 
So we have seen all the options for copying, pasting, sending to the back, and bringing to the front. Very well. One last detail regarding the buttons is that, although it is called Vertical Selector, we have the option here for it to be horizontal as well. It doesn't necessarily have to be vertical. Very well, let's adjust a bit more. With this, we have seen all the options for this type of button. We won't look at the next element, because it is exactly the same as the one we saw in the previous chapter, but with many more options, as we have also seen with the rotary switch. Now we can see this indicator, which is very interesting. As always, we will start by connecting it to our controller. We have it. We set the refresh time to zero to use the default, its X and Y position as usual, its size. And now, let's see that this is similar to the little lights we have, for example, on an equalizer or a VU meter. We can indicate what percentage is the green part, what percentage is the yellow part, and what percentage is the red part. If, for example, we have a light level, we could say that the first percentage, 20% as it is here, is the green part for consumption, for instance, the next is the yellow part, and the next is the red part. Let's try it. We can see that our potentiometer is synchronized with this, we see that the colors between green and yellow mix because we have configured it that way. Now we'll see that, depending on the values, it will display the color we set in its configuration. I believe it is configured from 0 to 100 from what I'm seeing. Let's check it. We'll take this opportunity to make it a bit narrower. Indeed, we have the value set to 100 here. Let's set it to 255. We could adjust the maximum range of this device from a memory variable if we want this value to be variable. And of course, we can also select what color we want these parts of the bar to be. These are the most typical colors, green, yellow, and red. We'll leave them as they are, and we can select how much we want the colors to mix. Let's set it to only 10% to see the difference. We can also select whether this orientation is vertical horizontal from right to left, or horizontal from left to right. The most typical is this. We can select the level of transparency we want for the part of the bar that isn't covered, whether it is transparent or not, and how many steps we want it to have, whether the steps go one by one, or if we want them to go, for example, 20 by 20 to make the jumps larger. Essentially, it is a visualizer of a level of something, it could be light level, temperature, power, or consumption. It could be any variable we want to connect to it. Very well. Now it should work with its correct ranges, and as you can see, it indeed does. The next element is a pointer. Essentially, it is like a potentiometer, but it simply shows the value it doesn't allow us to modify it on the device itself. The important thing about this pointer is what type of pointer it will have. We can select ours. For instance, I would like this one. We'll also connect it to our variable and test how it works. As you can see, we have a little arrow there. Let's place it here next to the potentiometer to see exactly how it works. As you can see, it is a pointer indicating the range we are in. If, for example, we wanted to control the level of a tank, it would be perfect to draw the tank and place an arrow indicating the level it is filled to. From what I see, it has a maximum configured range of 100 because when I reach 100, it is at the maximum. Let's check it and set it to 245. Indeed, the value should be 245. We can see that we have the option to select from Adkio variables what the start and end values are. We can set how much to multiply the value by.
for now, we are using it as it is. We can also decide if we want a symbol to appear and how many decimals we want the value to have. The image can be one that varies from bottom to top, or instead of being vertical as in the previous case, it can be horizontal, moving from left to right or right to left. Additionally, if we want to use text instead of the button to visualize the fill percentage, we can use text, which can behave just like in the previous cases. A vertical element that moves from bottom to top, left to right, or right to left. We like the option of using the image. And as you can see, it's simply an indicator exactly like the potentiometer, but only for viewing. In summary, it is an indicator that allows us to display levels. We'll place a level indicator here, and we arrive at one of the most interesting. Our RGB controller. Let's connect it to our Adkio light, to our memory position, and we'll see that it asks for three variables. Why is this? Because we need one variable for red, one for green, and one for blue. First, let's see what this object looks like. We'll place it here. Let's ask about its size. Width, 250. Let's set it to the same. Very well. We can see that with this object, we have the option to select the RGB we want, to select the brightness, the intensity with this control at the bottom, and to turn it on or off with these controls. At the top, we have a monitor showing the selected color. Let's connect it to our variables and use some example variables. The device to level. Let's see its address in the export. We'll take 2, 3, and 4 to form that RGB for this example. All right? So we'll take address 2, 3, and 4. We select 2, 3, and 4. Very well. We have it connected. Let's see what other features it has. We can choose to have an RGB controller appear, or just view it. When clicked, it will bring up the controller in a pop-up window. Let's check it. RGB controller. We execute it. We can select our RGB. We can select the intensity here. As you can see, it turns on and off. It turns on and off. Turning it off sets all colors to zero. And, as mentioned, at the top, we have a monitor showing the selected color. We return. We can select the size of this slider or this triple potentiometer around our RGB controller, making it bigger or smaller. For example, if we want to make it thinner, we can see that now it is much smaller. It's still usable, but not as comfortable to press. As you can see, it is an RGB control that allows us to connect it directly to Kasambi's RGB variables. If we want, we can add a description. The values indicate at the bottom that they range from 0 to 255, which fits perfectly with Kasambi's range. We could write here, select color. Let's see where it appears. I believe it's only for cases where we set it as a control. It will likely be the title of the pop-up window. I'll check it. Indeed. It is the title of this window. We select the color. Let's leave it as yellow. It's a color displayed in a circle, simply occupying space on a screen. When we want to modify it, we just need to touch it, and it will open a pop-up window where we can comfortably select the color. So let's make it smaller. Perfect. So by touching it, we select yellow. 
a very easy RGB controller, convenient to use, just connect its variables. Let's go back to editing and look at the next element in our Advanced Objects tab. The next element is a control that allows us to use multiple texts depending on the value of a variable. At the top, we can indicate which of our AdKeo variables we want to connect to. As always, we'll connect it to Unit 1. And now at the bottom, we can add elements. When the value is, for example, 0, this will be OK. Let's test using this control to display errors from the Kasambi network. So, you remember that zero was OK. We can select the font type for each of the elements. It has a huge size. Let's make it smaller and see how it looks. We have it here. And now you can see OK because the variable is zero. But once we change it, it's no longer visible. Let's test by adding more elements, since this object is perfect for managing errors in the Kasambi network to show them to the user, I'll create a few more of these elements so you can see how it works. We already have three elements created here. Obviously, we would need to create them all. Let's test it. I've expanded the field a bit because longer messages were getting cut off. And I've also made another modification to test this properly. I've removed the lower and upper limits we had, where the minimum was 18 and the maximum was 25, from this field so we can enter the values that interest us here. All right, so let's run it and see that if we enter a 1, the message changes. And with the next element we have, if it's error 9, the message changes again. All right, so simply by putting the error code that comes from a Kasambi network element into a shared variable with the screen, the screen is able to convert that error code into its corresponding message for the user to understand. It's a very useful component for these kinds of cases. OK, back to editing. I'll leave the error table here again that we can obtain from the Kasambi network via Ethernet. So if you need it, you can take note. All right, I'll give you a few seconds to take a screenshot if you wish. All right, so this is the last useful component of all that we have in this palette. We have a few more, but you'll practically never use them. If you want to explore them on your own, obviously, after seeing how all the previous ones work, it'll be very easy for you to check them out. So, with this, we conclude this chapter 3.2, where we've seen all the advanced components that we can use and that are very interesting for creating our custom control interfaces for our clients. See you in chapter 4. Bye for now.